Hello, welcome to the special coverage of the Mighty Yangtze. We're bringing you this live streaming from Shanghai. Well, this is not exactly a typical Shanghai setup. Actually, we're now in a shed. So why we have to be in this particular point in Shanghai to talk about biodiversity? I have the right person to explain it all to us. So let's welcome Mr. Zhang Yimou, a wetland conservationist with WWF China. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Pan, for inviting me. Hi, everybody. So, first things first, why we have to be in this shed? Well,、uh, this is called a bird hide.、Mm. A bird hide is some place where you hide. For watching birds, so you can look around here. It's it's a herd, of course,、mm. and、uh, there are small windows,、mm. and these windows where we just、uh, set up our uh, uh, telescopes and、uh, sometimes the binocular.、Mm. And and talking about setting up telescopes,、uh, what's that gentleman doing there? Exactly, he's using a telescope to watch birds. So he is counting birds, so so that we know how many birds are here and how many of each species of birds are here. So this is actually talking about a big plan of、uh, conservation、um, at this particular point. We know、um, this. We are on Chongming Island, right? And this is、exactly. on the on the easternmost side of Chongming Island, and this is the, on the edge of the mouth of the Yangtze River. Why? You and your local partners chose this particular place. Well, for many reasons. So、uh, people know that Shanghai is famous for the skyscrapers and、uh, for this uh, modern uh, art, uh, modern lifestyle. But I don't think many people understand and know that、uh, Shanghai is also quite valuable in terms of its、uh, biodiversity. So Chongming Dongtan is the most typical place in Shanghai in, in terms of that. So we can see really a lot of birds here. So different kinds of birds and large population, especially in the Chongming Dongtan、uh, Nature Reserve. Right. So talking about、uh, seeing birds here,、uh, tell us、uh, what are we seeing now?、Uh, what are the exactly those、uh, white spots? If <laughs> we don't use any kind of equipment. Well, so uh, these uh, white spots,、uh, of course, they are birds, and most of them are egrets.、Uh, also, uh, some uh, uh, black-faced, uh, black-faced spoonbill. So these,、uh, well, these species are actually newly、uh, promoted or become. I don't want to use the word promoted because、uh, it becomes more endangered. So it's it's now、um, in the level one endangered species,、uh, protected by the、uh, Chinese government. And also, besides the white spots, actually there are also many small gray or black dots that you can see they're running on the surface、uh, on the mat flat, and they are also, and, and the, the number, I th- I th- from I can see, I think is higher than the, the white spots or, or the egrets. So、uh, talking about that、uh, black-faced spoon bill, why it is endangered? At this particular moment, well,、uh, the, for many reasons. So,、um, as you know, the birds migrate. So,、uh, the loss of the population of a certain species usually are sh- are attributed to the problem in many places and in the species, many countries. So, actually,、uh, it is a fort- fortunate story,、uh, although it is now.、Um, Level one protected species, but the fact is the total population of the species is rising steadily but slowly. So uh, it uh, it is、uh, thanks to the joint efforts in, the, in a lot of countries, especially in China. So this air, this、uh, population of the species, the black-faced spoonbill, is now about seven five thousand to six thousand globally,、mm. mostly in Asia. So having said that,、uh, can we say that、uh, one of the focus of your work here is to provide sanctuary or migration haven, if you? You、uh, you will for those birds you just mentioned whether they're endangered or not. Well,、uh, th- that's right. So、uh, I think that only describes the base the basis of our work. Just to protect, protect、uh, provide a sanctuary for the birds here. So、uh, this is the minimum work we've been doing. But actually.、Uh, Building on that, we are trying to explore innovative technologies, sometimes mechanism, to protect these birds and try to to promote it, to communicate with our fellow 
conservationists throughout China and uh, tell them how uh, our successful stories so that they can take a reference. Well, uh, that, that is quite intriguing. So uh, all I can see is a large portion of wetland there. Where is the technology? <laughs> well, uh, sometimes technology is not about the the, the core, like uh, the the business of secrets or gadgets. You're right. So our secret here is at the water level, exactly the thing you see, the, the large, vast, the vast area of water. So we actually adjust the water level here by ourselves, where we have a plan. So in a small area, it can be maximized, the, the effects of conservation can be maximized by adjusting the level of water. So in some, in some seasons, for example in winter, our guests are the ducks and the geese. They, 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 they enjoy swimming, so they enjoy the, the deep water. So that we, uh, in that time, we uh, raise the water level to a higher level so that they can make, fully make use of, of it. But in migration season, usually in the spring and in, uh, in autumn, as now we lower the water level so that there are more small islands with uh, quite a uh, gentle steep, uh, gentle uh, slope so that birds, the shore birds with the long legs can stand on it. So is this a common practice or this is kind of um, an invention uh, from your project? Uh, it, it is. So uh, this, this uh, it is kind of an invention uh, from, from uh, you and your team. So uh, actually, we took we took a reference from our fellows globally. So our fellows, and for example, in Hong Kong, uh, also at WWF, they have tried this uh, uh, technology, I say it, uh, a couple of years ago, and found it quite uh, effective. You, you you can you can imagine Hong Kong, like Shanghai, is also a uh, metropolitan, so uh, people cannot set aside a large area of, of, of uh, wetland for conservation because the, the area is really small in these two cities. So for the quite precious area where people reserved for uh, uh, against development, people need to maximize the, the use of it. And that's why our, uh, people invented the way to uh, address the water level. Of course, their experience there is, is successful, but we cannot simply copy them here. So a different area has the different kinds of species and then numbers and, of, uh, and, so, and the, the, the proportion of them. So we tr in the past, uh, six years, we try to find the best uh, scenario and what level, I mean, the what level uh, scenario for these species and found our best way here. So I believe this is just a part of your pursuit on Chongming Island. Um, how large is uh, your field of experiment? So uh, what we have seen is mm. about one square, square kilometers mm. and actually we've been working on three square kilometers. So there are much more. So. Can you take us uh, to take a better look? Yes, of course. Yeah, let's go. So, Mr. Zhang, uh, we've just seen um, so many birds. Um, that was quite a lively picture. So, why are you taking me here? This particular piece of land looks a little bit barren to me. And what are those? Those are grass? Yeah, I, th I think barren is the very exact word to, to, to describe this piece of land. Mm. So. Uh, these are grasses. Looks like there. Looks like uh, the, the 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 place where we have seen a lot of birds. Yeah. But just try to find anything alive there besides the grass. Can you see anything alive? Anything? Not really. Not really. Birds. Grass crabs. and dirt and water. Nothing else. That's right. So uh, this thing is called spatina. Spatina. Uh, what is it exactly? Um, is it kind of an uh, an original species from China? No, it's an invasive species, sometimes called alien invasive species. That uh, sounds quite threatening. Well, it's, uh, it is actually. Uh, so uh, the nature reserve 
together with the WF has has made very much efforts in uh, control this uh, Spatina, this invasive alien species. So uh, on my left hand side, it is the nature reserve inside the nature reserve. So this nature reserve used to look exactly like the place, uh, like this land, this, uh, this uh, the, the, the barren part we just saw. Exactly. So. Uh, Actually, we're standing on on a kind of a borderline between the nature reserve and the outside land. That's right. So now we are facing the nature reserve. These species are mainly uh, common reeds. So the reeds are the uh, indigenous plant, and uh, th these are the vegetation that the anim the local animals, the indig uh, indigenous anim animals like fish, crabs, and water birds rely on, and that. The spatina is invasive, and the local species cannot make use of that habitat. And actually, although it's green, I would say it's a green desert. It's a green desert. Uh, how would you explain uh, this uh, seemingly self-contradicting idea? So uh, you, you see this um, this uh, grassland here. Mm. So usually we expect things, uh, live things like uh, like animals, birds, but because of the very dense root system, so crabs cannot live in there. And uh, so the root is the uh, problem causer. Uh, for the biodiversity, yes, but for the people, when people first introduced this, uh, this uh, species, people did not expect that. People made use of the denser roots to keep, keep the dike from erosion, to help the sedimentation, the process of, to, to accelerate the, the process of sedimentation so that people gain more land. Just think about this, 40 years ago, the, the notion of biodiversity is so exotic to the Chinese people when people are still struggling for the development of um, economy. So the, the people are, are eagerly, so, so eager to gain more lands from the, from, from the sea. And uh, these grass are considered one of the best contributor to this process. And back then, it sh uh, should have been considered as kind of an eco-friendly approach to gain land, right? Exactly. So people use that, people introduce that on purpose. So it, and it was considered a success when people first introduced this in grass in China. Actually, they were, tried, they were firstly introduced in some uh, labs in campus and then moved to the, to, to the seashores. Uh, sorry, uh, one more question. Uh, it was introduced into China, uh, but from where? From the North America. Uh, it, it originates from the eastern part of the eastern coast of the North America. And, and sarcastically, it is also considered invasive on the western coast of, America, of the US. Mm. So, uh, and it is, uh, well, it was uh, uh, introduced in many areas, also including in, in Europe. In, uh, in New Zealand and Australia. So it becomes a problem. This problem has been uh, recognized later by a lot of conservationists, and inc including here in China. So uh, the government, the Shanghai government, actually in in invests a huge amount of money in to, to get rid of this uh, uh, plant and, and to take it under control. So, uh, can we say that uh, people's awareness and understanding on biodiversity evolves with uh, people's um, uh, knowledge and understanding of species and better understanding of the nature? And that almost goes along with um, a particular areas or a country's socio-economic development level. I think so. And just think about the, the conditions when people, the Chinese people are, are in, were in, when the uh, plant was introduced. People 40 years ago, as you just mentioned. Exactly. So people are struggling for land for development and nothing, and no people really care about biodiversity. People would think the animals or the species are things that to be exploited. But it goes going along with the development of our, the economy as well as the mindset upon it. People began to realize that the ultimate goal for the development is to realize the harmony between human and nature. So that is, that is the process in, in which this, uh, the harm of the 
this plant was uh, recognized. And then the, when, we t when the economy goes further, we have the resource and technology to, 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 to control it. And that's why we are, I mean, WWF has the opportunity to participate in this process in, 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 in eradicating the species. So let's talk about uh, eradication of this particular invasive species. You just mentioned that it was quite costly to introduce uh, the Spatina into China. But is it costly to get rid of all of them? Yes. The local government spent millions and almost billion of uh, the budget and resource and all the matching knowledges and the brains in the process of control. Uh, that's in yuan terms, right? Of course, mm. of course. And uh, this is a single case in Shanghai, but you can imagine that all the, on the, all the coastal line of China, the Spatina exists almost everywhere. And um, the, the governments are also, I mean, the other local governments are also thinking about eradicating the species so that they can get, re restore their ecosystem. And that is costly too. And uh, luckily, the experience here, again, in Chongming Zongtan, can be shared and can be taken as a reference to, this, uh, to, to other uh, governments and other nature reserves. And we hope they can also get succeed. Uh, so um, explain uh, explain further on, on, on the experience you've gained so far. Do you have an efficient and um, cost, especially cost efficient way to get rid of Spatina? Uh, that really depends on the local uh, situation. So sometimes when the Spatina patches are small, we ha actually we do, we do have some uh, ex uh, successful cases in uh, northern Hebei. Some uh, simple uh, pest, uh, herbicide spray will be en enough, and that that does not make much uh, harm to the to the ecosystem. But in uh, in, the, in the places where the the expansion is is terrible, I mean the the, the expansion of Spatina, there's uh, more like the uh, physical plus uh, some uh, chemical ways are, um, are feasible, and that means a very high. Uh, budget in, uh, in, the, in such projects. Mm. So is this the only invasive species on Chongming Island, especially in uh, Dongtan Nature Reserve? Um, it's, uh, well, it is not, definitely not, not because uh, there are quite, a, quite some other species, but I would say it is the most uh, serious and harmful one. But I also want to add on that if we do not pay the price, of control, mm. it might be even more costly for the other harm it may do in the future. Right, so Mr. Zhang, we've talked about uh, birds, we've talked about uh, plants, uh, Spatina uh, in particular, that's an invasive uh, species. So I think it's time for us uh, to take a look at uh, the big picture of this nature reserve and even for the whole country, right? Yes. Let's go. Let's go. So, Mr. Zhang, uh, we've seen birds. I believe that's more about conservation, right? And um, we've also talked about how to deal with uh, invasive species. So, that's the threat we are dealing with. Yeah, exactly. And um, where are we now? Why are we on um, this water? So, uh, this water is uh, a part of the experience of the area we are managing so uh, well you, you see here we, you hear the but the sounds you, I, I don't think you people have the privilege to hear in the, in the urban area you see the, the, the rattle of the, the, the grass the scene of the birds so it's a part of the experience where we hope not only us but our visitors can enjoy so uh, if uh, my understanding is correct now you have about three square kilometers right. in this particular wetland on Chongming Island. Yeah. Uh, are you aiming bigger? Uh, not a bigger area, but a bigger impact. So we've talked about the, the uh, birds we are conserving here and how we deal with the threats, for example, the invasive species Spatina, 
but we uh, hope that our experience and our successful stories can be shared with our fellows. The fellows not include not only include that that in the Yangtze, so that's the key area I've been working on. My team has been working on uh, have, have, has been working on, but also throughout China. So throughout China, but we know China is a vast country, and different parts of the country, for sure. Uh, have different um, geological conditions. Um, are you prepared to to deal with uh, those different factors that maybe maybe uh, you've never seen in Shanghai? Well, uh, that's a very good uh, question, actually. So uh, that's right. Uh, the Geographic conditions and the ecological conditions of the wetland throughout China are quite different, and that is a uh, and that is a problem, or it's a it's a difficulty global globally for the management of such habitat wetland. In fact, that is because of difficulty. People has uh, I mean the, the country globally has uh, come up with an agreement called a Ramsar Convention which specifically focus on the wetland. So uh, China is a, is a signing party of the convention. And uh, actually China has already designated 64 Ramsar sites, which means the wetland of international importance. In fact, China will host the next conference of parties for this convention in, uh, in Wuhan, uh, now uh, planned in uh, 2022. And, and let's see whether, because of the epidemic or anything else, it can, that, that it will be changed. But we are aiming for um, a, a party, which is the a party of wetland, during a, during this uh, this uh, conference of party, because we hope that the country, the all the signing countries of almost globally, can make more ambitious commitment for conservation for conserving wetlands. So what kind of role um, your organization is expecting to play in this big picture uh, you just uh, talked about? Uh, WBF has a very special role in this uh, convention. So uh, this this convention is an intergovernmental convention, meaning that all the all the signing parties are governments, but it also recognizes six international organizational partners in this convention. So uh, uh, WWF is one of it. Global. That that means uh, non-governmental partners, right? Of course. So we and other organizations like uh, Wetland International, IUC, and etc. And we have the right to uh, participate in all the uh, uh, discussions of the uh, convention and, uh, and participate in the in uh, in the uh, conference of parties so uh, this is uh, and we actually uh, play a very active role in advocating this uh, convention in different countries so having said that how would you evaluate your cooperation with um, china's local partners um, whether their government local governments at different levels and uh, uh, other organizations so uh, from the government so from our perspective i think the uh, government is quite active in uh, promoting uh, wetland or co wetland conservation compared with other uh, countries throughout the world. So China is uh, one of the countries, not many countries, that has a specific department for wetland conservation at the central government level. And um, most of, well, not most, all the provincial level governments also have their uh, counterpart, I mean, administrations in uh, coordinating wetland related issues. Right, so um, what's the next step um, in the near future? For example, before uh, the 2022 convention, uh, the meeting of that convention you just talked about. So, uh, so there are a lot of things to do. So uh, for the part in, uh, in Wuhan, I mean, the, the municipal government, they are hosting this uh, uh, event. So they are preparing for the event by itself. And our central government is also uh, discussing the potential uh, uh, role that the, the leading country, that China as a leading country in this uh, convention, uh, the, 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 the conference, what kind of uh, gift it may present to the world. And for us, WWF, we've been uh, working now, I think this is our gift. It's, uh, we hope to finish uh, wetland curriculum for all the professional 
wetland managers. So tell them in very you know, very practical way on how to real maximize the uh, management effects of wetlands. And as I mentioned before, so wetland is quite diversified in terms of its uh, conditions, and people and, and this is difficult technically. So we hope to uh, uh, develop a simple guidance and curriculum so that our fellows can learn, can know how to design their management plan, how to follow the monitoring work, and how to adjust their actions in their daily work. Yes, um, that's all for uh, your area of uh, profession. So uh, if you're talking to common citizens, how would you explain to them the importance of uh, preserving uh, wetlands or some um, other uh, land uh, that's uh, important for biodiversity? Because um, at the very start of this live streaming, you just told me that, for example, in Shanghai, land is really luxurious. That's right. So I think for three reasons, I would say people will be, well, people could be very, uh, very sensible, could be very, uh, can, can feel the value of wetland. First is about the duty. So why are we here? Mm. We have the binocular. Yeah. Many people would like to pay a lot of money in going out just to enjoy nature. And wetland is the place where we people can guarantee that you can see the nature, you can see the living things, you can see the birds, the very cute animals. But if you think about other type of uh, the, uh, the habitats, I don't think that is so sure. You, you, you probably cannot see any tiger in the forest, if, even if we know it's a tiger habitat. You, 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 cannot, you can rarely see a wild panda if you go, go to a panda habitat area. But we are pretty sure we can see the beauty. We, you ha we, have, seen, we have seen a lot of birds just now, and we, ha we can hear the singing of the birds. So the second, I think people also rely on wetland. It is because we rely on wetlands, so that's, uh, that sometimes we just simply forget the value of it. Wetland provides us with the fresh water, which is so critical for our life and for our uh, product production for our economy and it, it, it is just too important that sometimes people just take it for granted that that's our government will take care of it and find us the best to, and at least safe water for us but it's very hard if we do not act together so the, fir the third thing is it also help us to adapt the uh, climate change disasters so we, we have seen recently a lot of uh, Nature, uh, natural, uh, natural disasters. Some, some most of triggered by climate change, uh, and many of them are in form of water. Sometimes they're too much water, or too little water, or just a, a, a not a unevenly distribution of water. And wetland is our secret weapon that can deal with these disasters. Once there's a flood, wetland is absorbed the uh, surplus water store it in the forms of the soil in the plants and in the dry season it it just gave out it, it gives out, out water gradually so that still we can have can make use of the water for irrigation for our drinking and etc so i think these are the three quite tangible things that uh, we can that 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 uh, wetland is uh, helping us for our life and for our production indeed so we can see that uh Building better biodiversity is uh, not uh, the work only for professionals like you, but it takes effort from every one of us. And that's it for this live streaming of our special coverage, the mighty Yangtze and Pandong in Shanghai. And this is Mr. Zhang Yimou with WWF China. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.